York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. How did a man who worked at the JFK Presidential Library grapple with the 35th president's legacy over his own lifetime to deliver a portrait of the real man behind the myths of Camelot. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on IART Radio, and a special tip of the hat to everybody who's enjoying today's time travel adventure via our YouTube channel. You can find me at historyauthor.com or across social media platforms, and you can read my columns in the New York Sun to get my analysis of current events through the lens of all the history I've learned from these books on the shelves behind me. In this episode, our time machine welcomes back one of my earliest guests. He is Stephen F. Knott, and he's the author of Coming to Terms with John F. Kennedy. We welcomed Mr. Knott on previously to discuss his book, Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance That Forged America. And that was in 2015. He co-wrote that with Tony Williams. You can find that interview in our archives at historyauthor.com or wherever you are enjoying this conversation right now. Stephen F. Knott is a professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. And in addition to his work with the JFK Library, he worked on the president's brother's campaign, that would be Ted Kennedy, when he ran for Senate re-election in the Senate in 1976. You can find him at stephenfknott.com or on Twitter and Facebook. I'll link to all of those accounts at the historyalter.com page for this episode. Okay, now that we've returned to the early 1960s, let's join Stephen F. Knott and dig into his very personal historian's journey, coming to terms with John F. Kennedy. And here we are with Stephen F. Knott. He's joining us to chat about coming to terms with John F. Kennedy. Welcome back to the History Author Show, sir. Well, thank you for having me, Dean. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Well, I was glad that you told me about your book. I love this journey. It's the perfect way to describe what historians should always be doing. And also they rarely do do it because we're afraid. Sometimes they'll tell you something off offline and then they'll say, just like a good journalist, but I don't want to put myself into the story, but you, you put yourself right here front and center, didn't you? I did. And I have to confess, Dean, that I was uh, sort of persuaded to do that by both my editor and a couple of friends. The first draft of this book, I actually didn't insert myself at all. And I think that's partly just due to an ingrained sense of humility. I mean, I, I never met President Kennedy. Um, so my relationship with him, to some extent, was tangential. Uh, but it was also quite firm. He's influenced my life in many ways. And my editor and a few friends convinced me to finally insert myself. And I do think it made for a better book. Yeah, I would have to agree with all of them because it's something that you might not have done because you do feel as if 
I'm hijacking this. I, I know as someone who reads a lot of history books, I've just put some aside and said, the, the author is inserting himself too much here. He's, there was one presidential hist history bio that I won't mention, but I waited years to read it. And I read, uh, I read a whole bunch beforehand. I won't narrow it down more than that, but I was looking forward to that one. I said, I'll start with Washington and I'll just read them all the way through. I'll read a bio on each, looking forward to getting to this one bio. And it was, it was just too much of the author and too much co contemporary comparisons uh, to, 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 at the time was the, was the nineties. And I just thought, this is too much the author's hand, and I don't want to see the author's hand in that context where there, there's a, a biography of, uh, of John Tyler that's like that. And President Tyler, they're just really trying to defend him and say he's the greatest. And yep. you, you don't do that here in coming to terms with John F. Kennedy. You make it your story and his story, and you make it what, a story of what we should do with all of our presidents, namely we should analyze them. And we should be willing to, just as we do with people we know, right? You say that guy did a little something weird. I don't know if I'm, I, gosh, I love that guy when I was young. We were such good friends. And now I don't, I don't like some of the things that he's doing. And that, that's a little bit of your journey. And I think it's great the publisher was, was encouraging you to write it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree, Dean. I think it made for a much better book. And um, I would hope that the readers of the book would perhaps undertake a similar journey in terms of their own political views. My views have changed over time. I grew up as a Kennedy worshiper, and I use that word with some precision. I moved rightward. I considered myself a Reagan Democrat, and I still think of myself as somewhat conservative, but I did feel it was time to reassess John F. Kennedy and the impact that he had on my life. And uh, again, in a way, this book is a plea for all Americans, perhaps, to just you know take some time, maybe break out of their ideological cocoon and uh, take a look at their own beliefs and how they, they came to those conclusions. I found this book just so important for that reason. And I'm probably gonna say it again and again, so everybody listening and watching at home, I hope they'll forgive me for that, but it's something I do all the time. And so I was drawn to your book. And I think once people get hooked on that, on a book like Coming to Terms with John F. Kennedy, maybe they feel oh okay i i can do that too i can i i don't have to i don't have to ignore for instance this uh, there was a biography on a president and they put in the appendix his record on race at the time instead of instead of dealing with it front and center throughout yeah. the book it was just shoved because the guy it was one of these bios where they really wanted to make it a defense of him as if they were defending yeah. him against the judgment of history instead of putting him out there and just letting everybody judge him for what he was and you mentioned that I, I love this idea, this vision that we get from coming to terms with John F. Kennedy, where you're this young, I don't know if they called you Stevie, what they called you when you were a kid, but here you are, this young kid, and we picture if it was a movie set that, that we've seen from the 60s, you know, you'd, you'd have the, the rockets there on the wall and Kennedy in the frame picture and the, maybe the velvet Elvis there right, right yeah. next to him. You know, he was a pretty, uh, an iconic president. And so I wondered, as I'm talking about you reevaluating as a person, you all of us reevaluating as a person, I mean, were there things that if you could go back and just peek into young Stevie's bedroom and say, I'm you from all those years later, and uh, I, I could say it, that you'd probably, first thing you'd tell him was take care of your hair. So I could tell him <laughs> that's why I'm wearing a hat. But, uh, <laughs> but if, you, if you could go back and tell that young Stevie anything that maybe look a little closer at and, and reevaluate, because your bedroom is, as you call it, a shrine to Camelot. What would that thing be? What would those things be? Uh, terrific question. Well, I'm, I'm torn, Dean, I have to admit, because I do think it's important for young people to have heroes, to have role models, both in their personal lives, but also role models in terms of uh, figures they may not perhaps know personally, but serve as role model. So I'm a little bit reluctant, uh, and it's a tough question, but I think if I were to go back, I might tell little Stephen, which is what my mother always insisted on calling me, uh, you know, just be a little more perhaps detached from a kind of worshipfulness or a kind of cultishness, uh, that it's not entirely helpful uh, to, to be see fellow human beings as flawless, as almost saint-like figures. And that's how I view John F. Kennedy. And if you, if you, to try to avoid that, then you're going to avoid the disappointment that will come later as an adult when you find out that we're all human beings, including presidents, and presidents and all human beings are flawed. 
I like that angle in general when looking at presidents because for me, when I was reading all those presidential bios, I tried to find something to like about each of them. It was just the sure. way I wasn't doing this show then. It was just something mentally that I wanted to do. And some of them really challenge you. You, know, you have James K. Polk buying and selling human beings in the White House for, in, within earshot of slave auctions. And you say, what could there, what could there be about, about this guy that, that could possibly be redeeming? It's so easy to hate somebody like that or somebody that really fails. And Andrew Johnson was no great great shakes in the in the race department either and and not just on racial issues you look at franklin pierce he had such a tragic personal life that you could relate to the fact that he in the white house he tried to run it as a committee and was a failure so i like to look at that and say these especially a martyred president to be able to look at them and say well at least that maybe they tried their best I mean, often they say that right i tried my best to do what was right um but for you here and coming to terms with, with john f kennedy you have not just that passing view of him. You don't you don't stop as that kid in the in your bedroom there with the JFK poster and then move on with your life. You're really deep into his life. You work at the library. So I wonder when when did those stirring stirring start? When was the thing that you found, as I think a lot of people who read history do, you you're reading something, maybe a newly released document, and you say, Oh my gosh, he was saying that in private? Or she was doing that. I never knew she did that because nobody talks about it. What were some of those moments that made you think, not that I hate this guy now, but you recognized, yeah, let me pick at those feet of clay a little bit because he was just a man. I think the turning point for me, Dean, came when uh, at my time at the John F. Kennedy Library, I began to see how the Kennedy family sort of manipulated the historic records that were kept at the John F. Kennedy Library. They would allow sympathetic historians, people like Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Doris Kearns Goodwin and others, access to materials that a lot of other historians were denied access to. And as much as I worshiped John F. Kennedy, even in my early 20s, uh, I also was a devotee of history. And I felt that kind of manipulation of the facts, manipulation of historic documents was just not healthy. And uh, that was really sort of the first break for me, Dean, uh, when I saw this kind of family intervention to prop up a legacy that I thought um, was admirable, but they were clearly unwilling to acknowledge any flaws in this person. And of course, he did have his flaws. So that's and, when it happened. And that's what makes you interesting as, as a person to me. That's what makes you a better role model, really, because as you said, it, it's one thing to be a young <laughs> child and say oh gosh i really admire so and so i love so and so you know you have the well not you but i was going to say a boy band poster on your wall but whoever, whoever you are whatever you have yeah it's one thing to to admire that i mean for for my generation for instance they had the uh you know everyone had that farrah fawcett poster not not me but they had that farrah fawcett poster was very popular and, <laughs> and people had that up there but when you get older, you realize, well, there's more, hopefully you do, to somebody that you're going to admire as, as a potential spouse than just looks. And to me, when you learn things like how much pain Kennedy was in uh, for much of his life with that back, with the, the back injury and then the pain there, that makes him more compelling, not less. I don't need to hear as an adult the same things I might have, you might have kept away from a child. So yeah. is that something you have experienced here throughout that you said, well, I, I found those things more compelling. Why not let somebody who casts a critical eye look at it and then say, look at what he accomplished despite some of these things? I think that's absolutely right, Dean. And I think Kennedy's illnesses, as you mentioned, he was one of our most sickly presidents. No question about it. Of course, they masked that and they were somewhat deceptive in terms of his own Addison's disease, for instance. But a full picture of John F. Kennedy, it seems to me, would acknowledge the fact that this man was incredibly sick and yet persevered. Um, I'm not endorsing lying about your health conditions as they did about his Addison's disease. Uh, but the fact is, I think he showed a tremendous amount of courage in overcoming these really debilitating illnesses and living a very full life. And I find that to be quite an admirable characteristic. And again, I do think a full picture of John F. Kennedy, he still emerges quite impressive. 
more more so to me than getting the two dimensional. And I think it's something he recognized in his <clears throat> lifetime when you look. And I love that about a candidate or a president or an office holder where they're a little bit self deprecating. That was something Eisenhower said about, and not particularly unique, but you know about take your job seriously, but never yourself, and that and that sort of thing. But Kennedy is in, is in another class because he is a martyred president. So people don't want to criticize you. It tends to boost your standing. Nobody wants to speak ill of the dead. At least they didn't used to before Twitter came along. But they, uh, but no, nobody wants to speak ill of a martyred president. And they want to talk him up and say the, say the greatest things about him. And for me, the, the moment where I, I saw some of this shift, well, they had the Chappaquiddick movie for one thing, which was obviously not, not President Kennedy, but his brother kind of sh- was willing to strip away some of that mystique that comes after he's assassinated, this idea of Camelot. But the Netflix project Blonde, there's a, a scene in that of JFK raping Marilyn Monroe. And it surprised me how little controversy that there was over that fictional scene what do you think that tells us about where the mystique of JFK stands today and how much of how much of our national mourning has ended or, or, or has gone away now that we realize that he's not just fixed in that moment in Dallas, but he's fading from living memory. And so now people are willing to treat him as, as well or as poorly as they do other presidents. Yeah, I think the legacy has taken a number of hits. And the fact is, Dean, that John F. Kennedy was a serial adulterer. Uh, And I'm upfront about that in the book. Uh, Rape, however, I think perhaps is a bridge too far. But I think that does indicate a kind of uh, reaction against the Camelot legacy that maybe that legacy lasted for 10 or 20 years. And then there's been a succession of hits over the decades, and that film that you just mentioned being one of many. Uh, But again, there's no papering over the fact that this man uh, was not an ideal husband by any stretch. Uh, But again, having said that, that the legacy has taken some hits, that his reputation has taken some hits, he still remains remarkably popular. The Gallup organization does a poll every four years or so of uh, asking the American public their attitude toward various presidents from the past. He still does remarkably well. He frequently comes in first in the category of which president could you bring back to the present day if you could do it. Uh, It's either him or Reagan. Uh, So, you know, Kennedy still has a bit of a hold on the American imagination, despite the fact uh, that his personal life was at best checkered. Well, it's... Something that I think you do here in coming to terms with John F. Kennedy is remind us that that's that's all of our jobs as Americans is to come to terms and to look and to I mean, this is something I do in my columns in the New York Sun. I always look back and examine what what they did, what they could teach us, what they did, for instance, with their with their limitations on them in the Constitution, how they may have expanded them. And you examine five areas, five of these areas here in coming to terms with John F. Kennedy. And one of those is his interpretation of those presidential powers. And that's a topic that's ongoing. Every time there's uh, an executive order, it seems it gets it gets really analyzed. And this people will say this should go through the the Congress, the representatives of the people. They're they're accumulating too much. They're legislating too much just just with the presidential pen. What do you hope your readers will learn today from coming to terms with John F. Kennedy, your book about what to expect from a president when he's executing his office? What do you think they'll they'll say, gee, JFK had something like that and it reminds him of the present day? Yeah, Dean, I think John F. Kennedy was partly responsible along with a number of other 20th century presidents in inflating expectations about what the American president could deliver. And I'm actually quite critical of him in my book on that front. He's very much in league with Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt in terms of believing in an almost all-powerful presidency and to some extent having a certain contempt for the other branches of government. Kennedy sort of assists in the rise of what some political scientists call presidential government, where again, all power, all focus is placed on the presidency to the detriment of the other two branches. And so there's no question that Kennedy shared that view. He was fond of quoting Woodrow Wilson that the American president should be as big a man as he wants to be. 
And I think that kind of thinking has uh, a distinct downside. And again, to a great extent, I think Kennedy contributed to a sense of inflated expectations, which were followed by disappointment when both the presidency and the federal government couldn't deliver on those inflated promises. And keep in mind, Dean, I think Kennedy is the perfect man for the moment in that this new technology of television allows him to create this bond with the American public. He was a master of TV. He was a master of his press conferences. And that is exactly the kind of presidency that Woodrow Wilson and FDR envisioned. Kennedy plays it to the max. But again, in my view, that was a kind of distortion of what the American system is about. And I just don't see that as a healthy development. In fact, I would say that's probably Kennedy's worst legacy, contributing to what some have referred to as a kind of imperial presidency. As you're speaking about that particular topic here and coming to terms with John F. Kennedy, it makes me think another rarity about your book that I was trying to describe at the beginning of our interview, and that's you moved you moved yourself here. And the the tendency so often is in history, I, I always say and write that, isn't it odd how dead people always agree with us? Because everybody says, oh, well, sure, if, if he was alive today, if she was alive today, if he, the, Kennedy would never stand for this today, or he would, he would, he would leave the Democrats if he were alive today, or, or Reagan would be so ashamed of today's Republican Party. These things are always said because people insist it's the easiest thing to do. They're not going to argue with you, right? So, you can, but I, I wonder, was that ever a temptation for you? How did you avoid that here in? coming to terms with John F. Kennedy, where you said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to move my opinion because the historical record is what the historical record is. Yeah, I think there is this temptation, Dean, amongst all of us to, we want to incorporate our heroes from the past. We want to place them into the present day. We want to enlist them in our cause, whatever that cause might be in 2023. And that did, by the way, happen to John F. Kennedy repeatedly in the last 60 years. In fact, his own family when they would be running, whether it's Ted Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or various nieces and nephews, would enlist JFK's legacy and make claims about a particular issue from 1992 or 2002 or whatever to say this is where President Kennedy would stand. Uh, that is a fool's errand, it seems to me. And it is something that I've tried to avoid. It does seem to me that we need to look at people, look at historic figures, in the context of their day and be very, very cautious about trying to take from that example and apply it to a present day issue over the national debt or crime in the streets or whatever. And I do think I've avoided that in this book. Well, I, I agree uh, on all counts. And I do agree that you avoided it here and coming to terms with John F. Kennedy because you'll, you'll find they say so much right? as bad in the modern presidents, especially you could find plenty of things. And that there was a great book by Charles Fishman and everybody could find the interview in our archives here at the history author show uh, called one giant leap. And he starts a chapter with a, with this bold quote, bold in writing and also in meaning where it's president Kennedy saying, I'm not that interested in space. And you say, <laughs> what the guy who yeah. single-handedly is responsible for the, this is the mythos, right? For the moon landing. And then that we went to the moon specifically as, as an homage and a tribute to his being assassinated. He wasn't that interested in space. And yeah, it was kind of a throwaway speech. And you didn't think we'd ever really do it. The moon's really far. Kind of, and so that shatters so much of that idealism. Sure. But then you realize we, we all say things publicly and we all have aspirational things. It doesn't mean that the President Kennedy was lying, but there's some, he had other things I'm sure he wanted to get done. And the moonshot would not have been a priority had he lived. It would have been something that would have, especially all the money you think that it costs and things like that. You hope that he would agree with something that he said today when he, if he were to read coming to terms with John F. Kennedy, and that's mythology distracts us everywhere. And I thought, what a, what a perfect quote from a guy who has become this myth in death, yeah. right? And yeah. there's so many of them that, that we think of. One is the, is the so-called trollop ploy. And that, that's his claim that there were two letters from the, from the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there was this brilliant idea. 
And that there's audio later of, of Robert Kennedy saying, well, uh, someone tells him, well, you take credit for it. It's, it's OK because you're running now. Exactly what you're saying about taking that legacy and using it how you wish. But th this thing never happened. And so I wanted to ask you, how did peeling the peeling the onion on some of those kinds of stories help you come to a truer understanding? It may not be that idealistic understanding, but how did it help you get to know President Kennedy better? And how do you hope that coming to terms with John F. Kennedy will help introduce that real man to your readers? Well, you, you touched on a perfect issue, which is the John F. Kennedy's role in the Cuban Missile Crisis. The legends that we've been sort of that have been handed to us are legends that were really created by Robert Kennedy with an assist from Ted Sorensen and Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And again, this is a perfect example of where they took a particular issue and they altered it somewhat to make Robert Kennedy's role in that event look quite impressive. And the fact is that Robert Kennedy's role in that event was distorted by Schlesinger and Sorensen and RFK himself in his own book, 13 Days. So we, we now know pretty much everything that happened during those critical 13 days because all those meetings were recorded. And the Robert Kennedy that appears on those tapes is quite different from the Robert Kennedy that appears in 13 days, but so is President Kennedy. And it's Robert Kennedy in 13 days that makes that trollop ploy that you mentioned, Dean, a sort of centerpiece of the missile crisis. And we now know, as you said, that's really not the case. And by the way, I should add, so, so in, in, in broad terms in answering your question, the President Kennedy that emerges from the missile crisis, in my view, is actually more impressive than the one put forward by the sort of legend or myth makers. Kennedy was a lone voice, John F. Kennedy was a lone voice uh, for restraint and for moderation and for avoiding World War III. But that's not the account we were originally given. And so, again, Dean, by plunging in deeper, by peeling back the onion, I actually think not only do we have a more fuller and accurate portrayal of President Kennedy, in my view, it's a more impressive portrayal. And we might have avoided a lot of the disasters in Vietnam if we'd been told and knew the, the full Excellent story. Point. because that. That's one of the things that LBJ says he believes all of this myth and and say he never backed down. John Kennedy wouldn't back down. We're not going to back down. We're not going to uh, lose this war and um, we're going to fight those those reds and stop them in Vietnam. And it, so it, and it, it does have this effect. And all these myths, they they're not these aren't myths that we might tell about Clark Gable. These are, these, are, these are things that influence governing today where people say, well, Kennedy said, to me, it's a form of grave robbing. It's historical grave robbing to take a picture of a historical figure and stick it up there with a quote. We're going to pick them up and make them these meat puppets for us and just make them speak. And it's not fair. And it's not fair even to a president who died, who died uh, tragically was murdered. So uh, yeah. that's something you get here. I'm, I'm glad that you looked back at this and said, we're, we're gonna look at this guy as a mortal man. We're not gonna lionize him in, even in the civil rights movement, where, which is something we really associated with him. It, questioning any of this was considered forbidden for such a long time. And you've kind of given us the first draft of the second draft of history here in coming to terms with John F. Kennedy. Well, thank you, Dean. Yeah, look, as adults, as citizens of a republic, we should want the truth. We, we have an obligation as citizens, as informed citizens, uh, to, to want the truth. We shouldn't fear it. And again, in a way, this book is an appeal to the American public uh, to you know, constantly reevaluate their own ideological views, reevaluate uh, historical figures perhaps that they may admire, not for purposes of tearing them down, not at all but for purposes of getting at the truth. And, you know, it's important that lessons from the past be learned and applied, but you can't do that if the lessons from the past are wrapped up in these myths. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who's out to tear people down, but I am a scholar who believes in the truth. And I would like to think that this book perhaps furthers our understanding of a particular president at an important time. And uh, I see that as a public service. You're enjoying my conversation with Stephen F. Knott, who is indeed doing a public service for all of us and for history in his book, Coming to Terms with John F. Kennedy. 
You can find our guest at stephenfnot.com or on Twitter and Facebook. All of those are linked on the historyauthor.com page for this episode. Note that's a Stephen with a PH if you're looking him up, and not is K N O T T. Tom Nichols, who's a contributing writer for The Atlantic, says, quote, Stephen Knott's reappraisal of John F. Kennedy's presidency is intertwined with a personal story of his own long journey away from the Kennedy mystique and then back to his clear-eyed appreciation of a leader who did his duty and deserved better than myths. This is more than a book about JFK. It is a call to remember the inspiration for a better America. Stephen, I think that's a great line about JFK deserving better than myths. If there was one myth about Kennedy that coming to terms with John F. Kennedy could erase from the historical record, I, I thought of them. I thought myself of one. I thought of that trollop ploy one. But I wanted to ask you what you thought yours would be. If there was one that you could get people to just stop saying, uh, and because it, it damages his legacy one way or the other, because we hear or worship him or we look down at him and denigrate him, what would that myth be? Yeah, I think that the number one myth uh, in my view, Dean, is this notion, and it's quite popular in some conservative circles of which, and I have many friends who are conservatives, and in fact, consider myself to some extent to be a conservative. But I think the notion that John F. Kennedy was simply, you know, good teeth and a full head of hair, something I've always been quite jealous of. Um, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> You know, that's not true. Well, yes, in fact, he was quite photogenic. He was a pro at using television, as I mentioned earlier. But he was also, I think, a man of some substance. He was fairly well read, and it wasn't just James Bond novels. He loved uh, political biography. He loved gen general histories. Robert Tuckman's The Guns of August was one of his favorite books. This was a man of some substance. This was a man who liked to think, as we say today, outside the box. Uh, this was a man who did not accept advice from advisors whom he thought were just sort of playing it safe. Uh, he did, he was something of an independent thinker and he was something of a man of substance. So I think Dean, this notion that he's kind of an empty suit is equally as equally misguided as some of the mythology put forward by the Camelot Portiers. So that would be the one myth that I would like to strike down, that he was an empty suit. Could I quickly add something else, Dean? And this is somewhat minor, but there is this myth out there that John F. Kennedy at the Berlin Wall referred to himself as a jelly donut in that Ich bin oh, ein Berlin yes. speech. Nail it. That is, that is complete <laughs> fiction. Uh, it goes back primarily to a work of fiction by the author Len Dighton called Berlin Game where he circulates that in a work of fiction, but people accepted it as fact. It's not true. The German audience of 400,000 people who were there that day knew exactly what John F. Kennedy meant, and they were not cheering the fact that he had just proclaimed himself a jelly donut. Yeah, one of my most most uh, despised ones as well, because it has all the things I dislike. It has smugness. It has false <laughs> false narrative. It has an uh, you know, insult of a president to, uh, by all means, insult insult our presidents, but uh, at least do it on what they actually said. In fact, the mayor of West Berlin looked over his speech for him, and he asked him if it would be okay, if this would be the right thing to say, and he did. So, yeah, this is one. Uh, I think I cited it in a column recently. Uh, and so... Uh, yeah, it's one I often uh, I often struggle to knock down if I see it out there because it's oh, good for you. I'm it, pleased to hear that. <laughs> so I'm glad you chose that. That was a good one. But uh, yeah, it, it always strikes me. It's a little bit like hamburger. If he'd been in Hamburg, Germany and said it, nobody would think he meant the meat bounty. Right. Even if it was yeah, yeah. slang in some places that. that right. Right. That. So, yeah, that's an that's an important one right there. So remember that, everybody go join our join our mission here, Stephen. I to crush that. So squeeze that out. He did not say I'm a jelly donut. But uh, you you have another Kennedy connection. You mentioned the brother, the the last brother of the martyred president, Senator Edward M. Ted Kennedy. He worked in his Senate campaign in 1976, and it always strikes me that, like his brother, we we always we always remember those one moments in a in a campaign. And for him, the moment was Roger Mudd asks him why he wanted to be president. And people treat that today. It's it's another myth that grows out of that as if. 
Roger Mudd, who I'm, I'm sure had no ill will in asking that question. It's pretty basic, right? It's like, you know, if you ask someone to marry you and they said, why? You probably would have a great, you should probably have a response ready for that. You know, you're running for president. And his answer actually is not particularly horrible, but people described it as this big blunder and that he, he just couldn't answer it because he didn't answer it the way, I guess, that they wanted him to. The thing about coming to terms with, with John F. Kennedy is here you have another way to look at it. You have a way to look at that Camelot mystique about 15 years, 10, 15 years after when here his brother is running and he's going to, as I said in the Civil War, wave the bloody shirt. They said of, uh, of Republicans and unionists that they were going to wave the bloody shirt. And he, oh, he had two brothers there that have been, been martyred, been assassinated, one that died in World War II, of course. So here you go. So he's the last one. He's the last surviving Kennedy brother what will people get out of your book about how that time on his campaign dealing dealing with the campaign issues day to day challenging for the democratic presidential nomination changed how you viewed it you you got to see a little bit of the of the camelot sausage being made there so how did that inform you and what will readers learn here then in coming to terms with john f kennedy well i think readers will learn that uh, in my view, Edward Kennedy's heart was never in that 1980 race or run, I should say. Uh, he was doing it. He was running against President Carter because I think it was just it was expected of him. Uh, but I often felt both then I was a much younger man then and now that his heart just wasn't in it. And the fact is, when Roger Mudd asked him that very simple question, and by the way, Dean, Mudd is not out to get Kennedy, as you mentioned. Mudd, in fact, was a close friend of Ethel Kennedy's. Um, so he was a somewhat sympathetic interviewer. But Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, could not really offer a, an impressive or coherent answer as to why he wanted to be president. And again, in my view, that's a reflection of somebody who really doesn't know perhaps why he wants to be president, but it's just expected of him. He's the last surviving son of Joseph P. Kennedy, and that was the thing you did. Now, the fact remains that Edward Kennedy is gonna go on to have a pretty impressive career in the United States Senate. I mean, people may disagree with the liberal policy stances that he took, but he was much more suited for the Senate than either Jack or Bobby, both of whom really didn't particularly enjoy their time in the Senate. So again, Ted Kennedy, flawed character for sure, but beyond that, just in terms of wanting the presidency, I really don't think it was in his heart. I like that part of the book as well. I won't get too much into it in the contemporary politics of it, but I find the the idea of this younger brother, I'm a, I'm a youngest brother myself. I have two older brothers, quite a bit older than me. And um, I could see that. I could see that role. I could see him, that, that would have been his life because you, you're used to, when you're the youngest, you spend a lot of time listening. You get your chance to talk, you talk and you, you organize your thoughts, right? And that, that was kind of, that was the role that I think that he was best suited. And considering that it would be very easy to say, well, he just got it. It certainly didn't hoit that he had the Kennedy name, but that wasn't the, but he made the most of it. And he certainly he became this iconic figure that was more than just uh, we've had throughout history. We've had people take over. Uh, that's how the first woman gets in the House of Representatives is because her husband dies. And so yeah. uh, it would be easy for him just to have flamed out and just have been a do nothing senator. I, he wasn't going to get he was going to get elected as long as pretty much he wanted to. So that, that's yeah. an interesting part here of coming to terms with John F. Kennedy as well. People will get and that idea of put anybody's picture up on your wall. It doesn't have to be for everything they ever did. And that was one thing they said about Reagan. They said if he could have, he would have put FDR's portrait up on the wall because that was his wartime president. Yeah. Said, but uh, you know, politics uh, would not have allowed it, and people would have been outraged. And they were outraged. You're trying to roll back the New Deal, and he said, "No, privately, just uh, I'm just trying to roll back some of this crazy great society LBJ stuff." That was what I was opposed to, not not that. And so I I like that about our presidents. They could admire different ones, and. You write about that here in Coming to Terms with John F. Kennedy. You say, quote, all unreconstructed ideologues will perish at the thought, but Ronald Reagan and John F. Kennedy shared many leadership qualities. How did you come to view Kennedy's relationships with Republicans like his predecessor, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and the man he defeated in 1960, Richard Nixon, differently as you live the journey here in your book? Because I think that we have more of those hardcore partisans than than ever that 
President Biden experienced this in 2020. He just tried to say that he had Republican friends, which is usually uh, a slur in the United States Senate, the way that it's used, right? And even that was too much. People said, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Yeah. You know, how could you dare be, break break bread and say that there was nice things? He's like, no, 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 I hate them. It's okay, I hate them, I hate them. And they, they were placated. But so th- this was a day when the, the it just was very different. And in fact, Robert Kennedy said, you know, if, if we get some real left winger in the primary, I'm gonna support Nixon uh, in the general election. And people are just shocked by that kind of thing. Yeah. So what will people get from, how, how you you could have in this different day somebody like a, a Nixon and a Kennedy or a Reagan and a Kennedy who were very similar and, and could draw from each other and learn from each other and emulate each other. Yeah, this is another reason why I wrote this book, Dean. I mean, John F. Kennedy, one of the person he admired the most was Barry Goldwater. Uh, he was very friendly with Goldwater. John F. Kennedy did not view politics as a blood sport. Um, And in some ways, John F. Kennedy was a very pragmatic person. And if there were ideas being put forward by a Republican, that didn't, the R after the person's name didn't matter. I think the ideas mattered to Kennedy. So again, this was a more civil time in the history of our country. Uh, Kennedy, you asked specifically about Eisenhower and Nixon. Kennedy, I think, was quite deferential to Eisenhower. Always made sure he kept Eisenhower abreast of the latest issues that were going on. Now, yes, he was critical of Eisenhower's structure, the way Eisenhower used the executive branch, and Kennedy dismantled a lot of the organizational charts that Eisenhower put together, but he was always quite respectful to him. And and regarding Richard Nixon, Kennedy and Nixon came into the United States House in 1946. Their offices at one time were just across the hall from one another. They knew each other quite well. They actually debated one another as junior members of the House in 1947 in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. And by the way, Kennedy later said that Nixon had beat him in that debate. Kennedy will also invite Nixon to his wedding uh, to Jacqueline Bouvier in Newport, Rhode Island in 1953. So uh, there was a connection there. And uh, in the 1960 campaign, of course, that relationship is going to be tested. I think after the election, uh, Kennedy develops a much more sour attitude towards Nixon. But again, I would say overall, John F. Kennedy had a view of American politics that was not a blood sport, that it was not treasonous to be a member of the opposite party. And by the way, Dean, you see this. John F. Kennedy also kept former President Herbert Hoover briefed. Uh, Hoover actually outlives JFK. John F. Kennedy and particularly Kennedy's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, were quite close to Herbert Hoover. So again, this is an era in American politics, which was, I think, far more civil than what we see today. And again, part of the reason I wrote this book was to at least give us a glimpse of a different way of conducting ourselves in the political arena. There was a moment that I was reminded of there. You're talking about Nixon and Kennedy's friendship. And I thought that when President Clinton won the White House and he had JFK Jr. there and and they they put out at the White House, I won't say that he personally did it because I don't remember, but that this was the first time he had been back. He'd been invited back to the White House. And the implication was not so subtly that, well, we had all these Republican presidents and I guess poor Jimmy Carter had never gotten around to it. But uh, it was pointed out Kennedy was his friend and Kennedy was friends with Nixon. Nixon was there for two terms, you're telling, well, almost. But uh, you're telling me that he he never would have had and, and he had had him in there, had the family into the White House and yes. allowed them to, to connect a little bit. And then this is something I think is particularly noteworthy. It tells us about both men because it tells us about JFK in reflection of the caricature we also have of Nixon, of this really furrowed brow scheming enemies list kind of guy and you say to yourself well wait like the kennedy kennedy's didn't make it onto the enemies list john f kennedy didn't make it onto the enemies list that says something because he seems like one of those guys where he he was real brittle he wasn't like uh, i often quote president mckinley and try to emulate him or president mckinley said i am a poor hater and he just wasn't good at hating people. Well, Nixon seemed to have an easier time of it. Certainly yeah. Woodrow Wilson, you mentioned earlier, uh, had an easy time hating people. 
And so I, I think that that says something positive about Kennedy as well and some of that political skill that even somebody who had that chip on his shoulder and was so ready to say, I'm going to settle scores with you, uh, like Richard Nixon, was was willing, was it, it played to his best dangers. It brought the best out in people. And I, I, find, I find that pretty cool. Yeah, no, I agree, Dean. In fact, Nixon invites Jacqueline Kennedy, young John F. Kennedy Jr. and Caroline Kennedy to the White House for a very private dinner in, I think, 1971, when Nixon is president. And it is to give Jackie and the kids a, a look at the new official portrait of John F. Kennedy that, of course, now hangs in the White House. But uh, Jacqueline Kennedy and Richard Nixon exchanged some very moving letters between one another, both before and after that visit in the early 70s. So again, there is a lesson here, I think. Civility has its place in democratic politics, small d democratic politics. And I think Kennedy and to some extent Nixon uh, understood that. You liken JFK to another president in coming to terms with John F. Kennedy. It's Thomas Jefferson, which may surprise some people. You write, quote, Kennedy fell far short of his own personal conduct, living up to the best. However, Stephen, this story doesn't end there. He, he's he, the story. If it if it had ended there, if he hadn't always tried to do his best, as I think anybody who reads history is called to do your best. You see people overcoming things and, or failing to do so, and you say, you know what? I'm going to be the best version of me I can today. I, I sound like a new age guru. The with the crystals, but it, it's true, right? This is what all religious texts, you know, the Judeo-Christian religious texts tell us, right? That we should go and try to be the best, try to do good things, avoid stealing the Ten Commandments. Really, if it was today and on Twitter, they would say, God, just summarize those. Moses would say one tweet, don't steal, because they all boil down to don't steal things, don't don't be coveted, don't, you know. So um, this is the thing, How how do you compare? How do you look at somebody like a Jefferson or a JFK? and tell folks look they're 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 guys they made mistakes we all make mistakes you can't hate or love them based on one thing that they did and at least as as historians if you're going to read it try to look at them with a broader perspective because it's not about them they're dead they don't care what we think of them right it's about us and being the best version we can and if it makes you feel like hey history is watching me and someday a historian's going to notice this thing that i do let me not do that that bad thing or let me really think about this decision how do you compare the good side of the ledger to the bad side of the ledger for John F. Kennedy today? And how can we find ways to credit him for the good things the way we credit Jefferson for his accomplishments and do that even though we recoil at Je Jefferson's case, the fact that he owned human beings, he was a slaveholder? Well, it's a very tough question. And I think we live in a time when uh, ideologues, perhaps on both sides or all sides of the political equation, have a tendency to portray opponents, both living and dead, uh, to place them either in the camp of good or evil. And there's no gray, there's no nuance. John F. Kennedy had definitely had feet of clay. Uh, he was a serial adulterer, as I mentioned earlier. But I think if you judge at least his public actions, and by the way, he knew what he was doing was wrong because he went to tremendous lengths to conceal it. Uh, but if you balance his public service, if you balance what I see as some of the more impressive presidential rhetoric in the history of the American presidency, for instance, his address to the nation on civil rights in June of 1963, where he really puts his White House on the line for the cause of civil rights, it seems to me that you, you need to balance the good and the bad if you focus just on the bad, you're probably doing that on the basis of some ideological or maybe cultish predisposition. And again, that's just not healthy in a republic. And you mentioned, Dean, you mentioned Jefferson. I mentioned him in my book. Look, Jefferson was a slave owner. He took advantage, apparently, of Sally Hemings, one of his slaves. But I also think that some of Jefferson's rhetoric, as with Kennedy's rhetoric, points the way for all of us toward a better America. And as you said, these men are dead, but we're living and we have an obligation to try to keep this, what I consider to be fairly impressive republic going. And in order to do that, I think enlisting these folks from the past who had some positive accomplishments, positive things to say, does point the way for all of us. 
So you don't have to be blind to their flaws, but you also want to avoid being fixated or focused on their flaws. And again, it seems to me, pick some of their positive qualities and use that to help this country in 2023. Well, everybody listening at home and you, Stephen F. Knott, I, I want to tell you that usually or often I wrap up asking people one final question, make your pitch for your book. You've just done it there perfectly <laughs> for coming to terms with John F. Kennedy and told everybody why they ought to pick it up. I think it's just really a, a great service to history that you've done here in the book, reminding people that we can admire somebody, but let's not fall into hero worship. Also, let's not fall into devil worship. Let's not make them the boogeyman. You know, there were things that they might have, that they that they did any president. You can find them. Trust me, dear listeners and viewers, I, I've done it myself. A president that I would think, gosh, it can't be anything good about this guy. And then maybe, maybe it's something as small as they told a joke and they were real funny and, and they, they had that moment. You say, okay, that shows me that human side. This is what uh, Martin Luther King in my uh, Martin Luther King Day column in the New York Sun, I, I wrote about this idea of the, the Greek concept of love and the three kinds of love. And, and Dr. King came back to that many times and said, you know, it, there, there's the, the highest level is like is agape in Greek. That you, that's the love God has for all humanity. We don't mean love your enemies in a romantic way. That would be ridiculous. Somebody's beating you, as he, he says on one occasion. But you can, you can look at them as a broader picture. That's what history allows us to do. That's what Stephen F. Knott allows us to do, specifically for John F. Kennedy here and coming to terms with John F. Kennedy. I want to thank you so much for joining us today to share your personal journey, opening yourself up here, admitting that, hey, I, I had to change on some of these things, and maybe I was flat out wrong on some of these things. You, you introduced us to the real man who served as our 35th president. I wish you the best of luck with this book. And I really appreciate the fact that you won't let it be another seven years or eight years, two terms before you write another book. So that's a hint because I loved reading this book and I'm looking forward to the next one. Don't let it be so long before we have you back on the show. Thank you so much, Dean. I enjoyed our conversation. Your questions were first rate. Wishing you all the best. Thank you. All the best to you, too. And I don't like to speak for the past, but I bet JFK would really like your book, too. Thank you, T. That's great to hear. Again, the book is Coming to Terms with John F. Kennedy. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the HistoryAuthor.com page for this episode. By buying the book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. That's a Back to the Future reference, by the way. I had somebody ask me, why do you say that? I said, because it's hilarious comedy. That's why. It's a reference. That's good writing. I hope you appreciate it as well, but if anybody out there doesn't like it, that's what I thought anyway. I'll be humble. I thought it was a good reference. My sincere thanks to a man who has all the right references right here in his book. His name is Stephen F. Knott. You just spent, hopefully, an enjoyable hour listening to him. I know I enjoyed the heck out of it. I appreciate him joining us and for introducing us to the real JFK, who's been obscured in the flash of an assassin's gun. Something that can be a crime to history to let the assassin steal not only the man's life, but his legacy as well. Please do visit him at stephenfnot.com or on Twitter and Facebook. I link to those accounts on the historyauthor.com page for this episode. If you enjoyed watching our conversation, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel for future journeys in the Wayback Machine. And you can visit historyauthor.com to find my social media accounts, as well as over 250 interviews with authors that you're sure to enjoy. Those include the one with Stephen F. Knott about his book, Washington and Hamilton. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Stephen F. Knott, thanks so much for time traveling with us today and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.